It's time for another romp around the ether to look at all the latest news in amateur radio and the wider world of communications. So let's jump into that atmospheric duct right over there and begin this week's newscast. Welcome aboard to This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,233 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Dayton Hamvention has announced that the Ramada Inn in Xenia is closing. We will have all the details as well as a look at Storms Julia and Carl. Florida amateur radio operators activate for Ian. We will have the wrap-up story this week. The International Space Station has a conversations with students in Antarctica. The San Angelo, Texas Amateur Radio Club celebrates 100 years. Nikola Tesla's Wardenclyffe Laboratory is transforming into a global science center and plays host to a Long Island Radios Club celebration. Lighthouses are in the spotlight for a seven-day special event station operation in the UK. And QSL cards. Hams all around the world love to exchange them. This week, we will take a look at the art and design of amateur radio QSL cards. All of that and a lot more is coming up in today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will talk about persistent client-side state information. What's that? You know it better as a cookie. Leah will talk about how one browser will soon let you block the European Union mandated cookie consent banner that you now see on most websites. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Australia's own Arnold Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will show how messy shacks are the way we do things around here. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill takes us back in time to look at the New Radio Act of 1912 and its effect on private stations. He will also talk about Major Edwin Armstrong's invention of the regenerative circuit using Lee DeForest Audion, and he will look at the very beginnings of the ARRL. And... Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will introduce us to all the jargon related to tower vocabulary. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where the fall colors are just about at their peak, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting this week from my home studio in Cortlandville, New York, where the leaves are coming down in buckets and the big piles will make for a perfect playground for the grandkids. I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, and the autumn leaves are looking beautiful right now. I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And reporting from upstate New York's Catskill Mountains, where it's official peak season for leaf peeping, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where we're near peak of our fall foliage season, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where autumn has finally settled in and old man winter is beginning to make his presence known, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with our lead story, here is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Leading off this week's news, the Dayton Hamvention has announced that the Ramada Inn in Xenia, Ohio, is closing. The Dayton Daily News is reporting that the city of Xenia will take full possession of the Ramada Inn on November 1, 2022. The land will be incorporated into the Xenia Town Square revitalization project. Hamvention, the largest annual ham radio convention in the United States, 
will be held May 19th through the 21st, 2023, at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia. A list of other accommodations can be found on the Hamvention website at hamvention.org slash travel dash parking slash accommodations. Thanks to funding from Amateur Radio Digital Communications Foundation, the Internet Archive is building an online digital library of amateur radio and communications, and they're asking amateurs for material. With more information on this ambitious project, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, who files this story through the facilities of the Southgate News Service. The Internet Archivist blog said that they want the obscure stuff, the locally produced ham radio newsletters, or the smaller magazines. The team has begun gathering content for the Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications, which will be a massive online repository of materials and collections related to amateur radio and early digital communications. The DLARC is funded by a significant grant from the Amateur Radio Digital Communications Foundation to create a digital library that documents, preserves and provides open access to the history of this community. This innovative project aims to digitise print materials such as newsletters, journals, books, pamphlets, equipment specifications and other records from both institutions, groups and individuals. They will also undertake a digital archiving programme to store, curate and provide access to what they describe as born digital materials such as digital photographs, websites, videos and podcasts. There will be a personal archiving campaign to ensure the preservation and future access of both print and digital archives of notable individuals and stakeholders in the amateur radio community. The archivists will conduct oral history interviews with key members of the community and they are dedicated to the preservation of all physical and print collections donated to the Internet Archive. The goals of the online digital library are to document the history of amateur radio and to provide freely available educational resources for researchers, students and the general public. The project is looking for partners and contributors with troves of ham radio, amateur radio and early digital communications related books, magazines, documents, catalogues, manuals, videos, software, personal archives and other historical record collections, no matter how big or small. In addition to physical material to digitise, they're looking for podcasts, newsletters, video channels and other digital content that can enrich the DLARC collections. Internet Archive will work directly with groups, publishers, clubs, individuals and others to ensure the archiving and perpetual access of contributed collections, their physical preservation, their digitisation and their online availability and promotional use for research, education and historical documentation. All the collections in this digital library will be universally accessible to any user and there will be a customised access and discovery portal with special features for research and educational purposes. You can find out more at gizmodo.com. That's gizmodo.com. In their release, they said that they're extremely grateful to ARDC for funding this project and are very excited to work with this community to explore a multi-format digital library that documents and ensures access to the history of a specific, noteworthy community. Anyone with material to contribute to the DLARC library, questions about the project, or interest in similar digital library building projects for other professional communities, please contact K Savitz, K6KJN, Program Manager, Special Collections via email to k at archive.org. That's Kilo Alpha Yankee at archive.org. We are proud to reveal that This Week in Amateur Radio has been part of the Internet Archive since our inception some 23 years ago, and look forward to being one of the first in the amateur radio community to be part of the new DLARC archive collection. We hope to keep in touch with the folks at the Internet Archive for periodic reports on the development of the new Digital Library of Amateur Radio and Communications. As Hurricane Ian was making its way to Tampa, Florida in late September, the Sheriff's Tactical Amateur Radio Communications Station, W4HSO, was preparing for activation. With a wrap-up on Hurricane Ian activation, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who has more in this report from League Headquarters. 
ARRL member Tony D'Angelo, N2MFT, said Stark was activated on Monday, September 26th and continued operations through Thursday, September 29th, 2022. Stark has amateur radio equipment in five of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office locations, as well as a Homeland Security office. It's a great working arrangement with all of the equipment provided for us, said D'Angelo. Our volunteers staffed those locations, and the remainder worked from their homes. Over the course of the four-day activation, 16 Stark volunteers worked 24 hours a day, passing information for age and assistance through the Sheriff's Office using WebEOC. That's a web-based emergency management information system. D'Angelo emphasized that Stark is not a club, but a service organization. Stark volunteers are required to undergo an extensive background investigation, including fingerprinting by the Sheriff's Office. Stark volunteers are civilians and employees of various Hillsborough County government agencies, Verizon, Tampa Electric, St. Joseph's Hospital, Tampa Police Department, and other public and private agencies. In the event of a disaster, radio operators provide communications between participating agencies if the normal means of communication are lost. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. D'Angelo is a retired police officer and has been a licensed amateur radio operator for 30 years. He will continue to monitor weather information in case another activation is needed. Cleanup and damage assessment from Hurricane Ian continues. Power outages peaked at 2.7 million customers, but new reports indicate power has been restored for 99% of the outages, leaving less than 5,000 residents and businesses still offline. All power was expected to be restored by last Friday. John Ross, KD8 IDG, is here with more info. Hardy County Emergency Management in West Central Florida lost power and all communications during the storm. But Hardy County Public Information Officer Alicia Woodard said it was amateur radio that stepped in to help. Our amateur radio operators here began relaying information to our county agencies, said Woodward. And a special thanks to Mike Douglas, W4MDD, ARRL West Central Florida Section Manager, and ARRL Assistant Section Manager, Technical Coordinator Daryl Davis, KT4WX, for their assistance during the storm. Hardy County received 27 inches of water. Normal flooding for that area is 16 inches, and most power is back on now there. Hurricane Julia made landfall this past weekend over Nicaragua with winds of 85 miles per hour. Now downgraded, the storm has moved out to the Pacific Ocean, but is still able to bring heavy rains to parts of Central America. In Nicaragua, there were reports of power outages, and 10,000 residents were moved to shelters. Officials there report 25 casualties with over 50 people missing. Hurricane WatchNet manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, reported late Wednesday morning that Carl is still a tropical storm. Although it's currently moving to the north-northwest, it's expected to make a sharp left turn and head south-southwest on Thursday. The National Hurricane Center is currently forecasting Carl to make landfall near Veracruz, Mexico late Friday or possibly early Sunday morning as a tropical storm, possibly even a tropical depression. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. The National Hurricane Center is currently forecasting Carl to make landfall near Veracruz, Mexico sometime today, possibly even as a tropical depression. The Hurricane WatchNet is closely monitoring the track and intensity of Carl, said Graves. Should environmental conditions change, allowing it to become a hurricane and threaten landfall as such, the Hurricane WatchNet will, of course, activate. Gel Lindgren, KO5MOS, can enter Antarctica into the log of contacts for him and the station aboard the ISS. This was the ultimate DX from space. In fact, as the U.S. astronaut held a scheduled question-and-answer session on Friday, October 7th, with students living on the Esperanza Antarctic Base, an Argentine research station on the frozen continent. For the contact, the astronauts used the called OR4ISS. This unprecedented ARIS contact was accomplished with the help of ON4ISS, AMSAT Belgium, which provided a telebridge. According to various websites, there are 16 students enrolled in the school, and they range in age from 3 to 21. The school, which has two teachers, was established in 1978. One student, apparently feeling a kinship about the relatively remote locations on both sides of the QSO, asked the astronaut, An icebreaker ship brought us here. How did you get to the International Space Station? Acknowledging the similarity of their desolate environments, the astronaut responded saying, 
you are explorers in your own right. He also accepted the student's invitation to visit someday. The best follow-up to this kind of first-time DX would naturally be an eyeball QSO to remember. You can listen to the QSO between the ISS and the Antarctic-based students. The conversation is available on YouTube. Amateur Radio on the International Space Station is seeking formal and informal education institutions and organizations, individually or working together, to host an amateur radio contact with a crew member on board the International Space Station in 2023. Organizations that want to participate will need to submit a proposal no later than November 13th of 2022. ARISS is looking for proposals that will draw large numbers of participants and integrate into a well-developed education plan. To assist with the proposals, ARISS has posted information about expectations and guidelines on their website. In addition, an ARISS proposal webinar session will be held October 13th of 2022 at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Ares anticipates holding the contact between July 1st and December 31st of 2023. Crew scheduling and ISS orbits will determine the exact radio contact dates. Crew members aboard the ISS will participate in scheduled amateur radio contacts approximately 10 minutes in length, and they'll allow students to interact with the astronauts through a question and answer session. An Ares ISS contact is a voice-only communications opportunity via amateur radio. It takes place between astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the space station and classrooms and communities. ARISS contacts afford educational audiences an opportunity to learn firsthand what it's like to live and work in space. Such contacts provide the chance to learn about space research conducted on the ISS. Students will also have an opportunity to learn about satellite radio communication, wireless technology, and radio science. Amateur radio organizations around the world, with the support of NASA and space agencies in Canada, Japan, Europe, and Russia, present educational organizations with this opportunity. The ham radio organization's volunteer efforts provide much of the equipment and operational support that enables communication between the ISS crew and students around the world. ARISS is a cooperative venture of the International Amateur Radio Societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the U.S., sponsors are Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, ARRL, the ISS National Space Laboratory Station Explorers, Amateur Radio Digital Communications, and NASA Space Communications and Navigation Programs. The primary goal of ARIS is to promote exploration of science, technology, and engineering, the arts, and mathematics topics. For more information about ARIS, visit their website at www.ariss.com. Dot org. October 15th and 16th, 2022, is Session 3 of the ARRL EME, or Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth Contest, for frequencies between 50 and 1296 MHz. It's never been easier to complete the Earth-Moon-Earth -Earth circuit. Lance Collister's W7GJ 6-meter EME array document from 2010 talks about the minimum frequency you'd need to decode signals from the moon, which can be boiled down to a good antenna, reasonable radio, and appropriate software. Activity also helps. With a regular 6-meter antenna, it should be possible to copy signals from the moon at moonrise, taking advantage of ground gain. The ARRL Foundation Club Grant Program opened a second grant proposal period, which began September 7, 2022, and runs until November 4, 2022, at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Radio clubs can apply now, and information about the program can be found on the ARRL website at www.arrl.org forward slash club hyphen grant hyphen program. Following the first proposal period that ran earlier this year, 128 clubs applied for grants with a variety of outstanding projects. Emphasis is placed on projects that have a component of community involvement, training, new ham development, and club revitalization. 24 clubs were chosen, and nearly $270,000 was awarded. Clubs that applied in the first round and did not receive a grant are urged to reapply. 
the ARRL Foundation will award an additional $230,000 in grants at the end of the second application round. An informational webinar was held on September 7th, and a recording of that event can be seen on ARRL's YouTube channel. Congratulations to the Suffolk County Radio Club, W2DQ, which celebrated its own personal history of 75 years at a site where groundbreaking history was once made by innovator Nikola Tesla. The club's special event activation and outdoor celebration was held on Saturday, October 8th at the scientist's former laboratory, Wardenclyffe, on Long Island, New York. Portable antennas provided the radio reception and a gathering of friends and food, plus a visit from local elected officials, provided the rest of the reception. A good time was had by all in attendance, and the club looks forward to their next 75 years. According to NASA, two amateur radio operators were recently chosen to return to the International Space Station, but this time they expect to arrive there aboard the first flight of NASA's new Boeing Starliner 1. Astronaut Scott Tingle, KG-5NZA, will be its commander, and Mike Fink, KE-5AIT of NASA, will serve as the Starliner's pilot. They will join Jeanette Epps, KF-5QNU, who will be aboard as mission specialist. NASA signed her in August 2020 to join the crew. There is no launch date yet for Starliner 1. It must complete NASA's Boeing crew flight test, which ensures the spacecraft can fly crewed missions to the ISS on a regular basis. This is part of NASA's commercial crew program. The first test flight is scheduled for early 2023. Members of the Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club's Pedal Radio Group took to the road recently for a great charitable cause. Throughout the month of October, these most mobile of the mobile operators are getting themselves in motion to meet the Great Cycle Challenge, which is raising money throughout Australia for research into childhood cancer. This is an event that the Pedal Radio Group participates in each year. The group's spokesman, Graham Knight, VK3GRK, said, This is a great chance to get out, have fun, exercise, and promote amateur radio. Riders pledge how many kilometers they will ride and how many dollars they hope to raise. As Graham also notes, there's nothing to stop riders from carrying an HT, safely of course, making contacts or chatting amongst each other. He asks, could this be bikes on the air? Perhaps yes, but remember, it's kilometers that count most here, not contacts. The Radio Society of Great Britain will host the Transatlantic Centenary Tests during December 2022. The international event celebrates the centenary of the transatlantic success of the RSGB in December 1922. On December 24, 1922, the very first verified amateur radio signal from Europe was received in North America. The signal originated from the RSGB station G5WS at Wandsworth in South London as part of the third transatlantic tests. Unlike the tests of the 1920s, which consisted of one-way communication, the December 2022 tests will encourage worldwide two-way communication with the United Kingdom and Crown dependencies. There will be a series of awards available for making contacts with those who are activating special call signs. For this centenary celebration, the RSGB has renewed five call signs, which they held in the 1920s. G5WS from the 1922 tests, which was the first to get across. G5AT from the 1923 tests. G6XX from the 1923 tests. G6ZZ used for the first amateur tests on a moving railway car in 1924, G3DR, Scottish Highlands Call. These historic call signs will be activated by RSGB members and clubs using G5WS, G5AT, G6XX, G6ZZ, G6DR, England, GM5WS, Scotland, GW5WS Wales, GU5WS Guernsey, GD5WS Isle of Man, 
GJ5WS Jersey, and GI5WS Northern Ireland. Full details on how to participate are available on the RSGB website. The San Angelo Amateur Radio Club, based in San Angelo, Texas, will celebrate their 100th anniversary on October 15th. With a close look at this historic amateur radio club, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who has all the details in this special report. The club is engaged in a century of community service, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, that's the STEM program, education, emergency preparedness, and disaster response. Founded in 1922, Sark held their first meeting on June 14th of that year, and membership today has grown to 40 members. The celebration will take place this year at their clubhouse, located at 5513 Stewart Lane in San Angelo. It will include a tailgate swap meeting starting about 9 a.m., amateur radio operators working to make contacts with 100 stations in honor of the club's 100th anniversary, and the Boy Scouts Jamboree will be there as well. The call sign W5QX honors Carl Bringar, who originally held the uh, sign of 5QX before the W prefix was added. He was one of the earliest members of SARC. SARC is currently working its, in partnership with Angelo State University's Mayor Museum, located on the campus of Angelo State University, to create a 2,000 square foot exhibit that will tell the story of local radio pioneers. Topics will include amateur radio operators, retail radio businesses, public safety and radio innovators, and broadcast radio stations that formed the Concho Valley area in the 1920s and 1930s. Club member Mike Dominique, KD5URW, said Sark is the only club within a 70-mile radius of San Angelo, Texas. Our club and amateur radio emergency service volunteers cover 14,000 square miles with a population of 165,000, said Dominique. With cell phone coverage along only major roads and highways, amateur radio is the only communication during storms and tornadoes. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Dominiana, there will only be 381 licensed amateur radio operators in the area, and the club is working on grants to add and upgrade repeaters under a five-year plan. The San Angelo Amateur Radio Club is an ARRL-affiliated club. At least 68 travelers from Bengal were left stranded earlier this month in Nepal as monsoon flooding and landslides ravaged the landscape. As the tourists' cell phones died, amateur radio stepped in. According to a story in the Times of India, hams in Nepal began rescue communications and reached out to the West Bengal Radio Club on behalf of the tourists. The club contacted the Nepal Consulate for assistance. The Nepal Tourism Board arranged for rescue teams, including helicopters, because travel was restricted by road damage. Where possible, local hams carried rations to help the stranded tourists from Kolkata. This weekend, much improved weather conditions brought hope that the tourists could be returned safely home. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Good news if you, uh, do you, yeah, I'm wondering, what do, so I'm going to, I'm going to make a big confession here. I and my friends, my ilk, the geeks, whenever I'm doing a show, you know, I do a bunch of other podcasts for like hardcore enthusiasts like Windows Weekly. You know, it's all about Windows, Paul Theron, Mary Jo Foley, or Mac Break Weekly. Or, you know, I do all these shows for, you know, people are really like into it, enthusiasts. And when I mention this show, the radio show I do, I always say the normal people listen to the radio show. I hope that's not offensive, but it just, <laughs> you're good. No, you're normal. It's not, it is we who are not normal. We're the, you know, the, we care abnormally about all this stuff and think about it all the time and all that stuff. The enthusiasts. But, but one of the reasons it's really great to do this show is to connect with real people in the real world and understand that their view of what's going on in technology is often very different from how, you know, we nerds, we geeks think about it. I'll give you an example. Well, actually, I'm actually, actually asking you as a normal person what you think. When you surf around, whether it's on your phone or your computer, you go to a website, you see that thing pops up that says, hey... We use cookies on this website. And then sometimes it says, you know, what's your preference? Sometimes it doesn't even say that. It just says, you want to know more? Click this link. Otherwise, say okay. The, the infamous cookie consent banner 
Have you no just out of curiosity? You notice that, right? How annoying is it to you? It's very annoying to me. <laughs> it it comes from European regulations, European uh, privacy regulations. And it really comes from a complete misunderstanding of how the internet works. Your European privacy regulations, I'm essentially all four. I mean, privacy, yeah, good thing. Not a bad thing, good thing. But they had decided some years ago to demonize cookies. And I think a lot of people, again, speaking as a geek, we kind of know what those are all about. But I think a lot of people, normal people probably go, yeah, cookies bad. And so the theory, I guess, is this site is now warning you, well, we use them. Good luck. Have fun. Because they're required by law to do so only for Europeans. But it's such a pain. You don't. Very few sites say, well, is this person from Europe? Okay, I'll show it. Otherwise, I won't. They just go, yeah, pop it up. It's too hard to be sure if somebody's coming in from a country covered by those regulations. So, you know, pretty much all websites do it. The cookie consent banner. You know, for background, just to fill you in a little bit, it's a complete waste of time. It's completely stupid. <laughs> it's a, In fact, it's probably a bigger, get this, a bigger violation of privacy than the cookie. What are cookies? I guess we need to understand what cookies are. So when you have a program, you're working on a, you know, Microsoft Word document or, you know, you're, you know, you're playing Candy Crush or whatever. When you close Candy Crush or Facebook and then reopen it, it knows who you are and where you are, right? It knows how many, what level you're on and things like that, right? How does it do that? Cookies. In a program on your computer, it's called preferences or save settings or, you know, save my current situation kind of thing. So when you're using playing Candy Crush on your PC, it just saves that to the hard drive. When you're on a website, same thing. When you're on Facebook, it saves a cookie on your computer that says who you are so you don't have to log in every single time. And if you want to know what these cookies do, it's easy. You go in your browser, clear all the cookies. And then you'll see you have to log in again to every site. You have a lot of stuff that the sites don't remember about you, your trouser size or what level of candy crush you're on, that kind of thing. That's what those are. They're, they're simply preferences. And, 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 and really, they've been around since the web started. The technical term for them is persistent client-side state information, PCSSI, which really annoys me because they could have called them pixies and everybody would have been much happier. Because that's PC, SSI, persistent client side state information. State is your state, your state of being, your state of, your, your, the current state of your program. You're saving it. And it's persistent. So when you come back and it's on client side because you're the client and it saves locally. It doesn't save it on their site. It saves it locally. You're not going to save. Facebook's not going to save all those settings. You know, it saves some on their website, but most of them that's on yours. Okay. So it's useful. It's necessary, frankly. There is a potential privacy problem with cookies because when they were designed, they were originally designed by Netscape, by Mozilla for the Netscape uh, browser. Remember Netscape? And, you know, very early on in the mid-90s when the people started using the web, they realized, oh, we really need a way to kind of remember your state. So when you come back, you know, it's not who the hell are you? It's, hi, welcome back. That's nice, right? And and when they were designed, they, they knew that there'd be a privacy concern. So the rule is... The only site that can look at those cookies is the site that saved them. Only Facebook can look at Facebook's cookies. That's, an, that's sensible. But, of course, Facebook being Facebook and other companies, they'd like to know where everywhere you go on the web. Let's say you're a, a coffee shop, Buckstar's coffee shop, and uh, and you know that a lot of people go to Unkin' No Nuts. Buckstar wants to know when you go to Unkin'. But how would they know that? Well... And here's where Facebook came in and Google and others. It turns out when you go to Unkin from from Buckstars, Unkin doesn't doesn't know what you what what your favorite Aperino Frecciatino was. But Unkin might have a Facebook like button on there. Oh, that's interesting. That Facebook like button is like a little teeny weeny web page. <laughs> and it's a loophole because it means now Facebook is open on that site and can save a cookie, can look at cookies. So suddenly, if Buckstars and Unkins both have Facebook like buttons, Unkins can see that you've been to Buckstars and that you like the Achapina Wattapina. 
So <laughs> that's what we call third party cookies. There is actually no such thing as a third party cookie, but it's the idea that you uh, th- uh, you might be able to tell as a third party where people have been. Uh, put enough like buttons on the web, Facebook knows everywhere you've been. In fact, that's the whole idea behind the like button. And then later, of course, the Facebook login and the Google login and the Twitter login. Well, they're all just trying to figure out where you go. So we call them third party cookies and technically they're not. They're still first party cookies. So that's the privacy uh, damn, you know, risk is, yeah, that's not a good thing. The cookie banners <laughs> don't do anything about that, by the way. They make you feel good, uh, except they don't because trillions of man hours, human hours are wasted kicking, clicking those banners. They get in the way. They're really bad on mobile because you don't have a lot of screen real estate anyway. They're just an annoyance. And in the long run, they just make you go, fine, 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 cookies, cookies, cookies. I don't care anymore. Enough with the cookies. And there's even a privacy potential because those cookie consent banners hit you before any cookies are set. That's the rule, right? But they themselves can be monitoring you. So they could be worse than a cookie. Okay, fine. This is all a long way around to say that browsers now are starting to block cookies. Hallelujah. It's probably illegal in Europe. You Europeans don't use Brave, but Brave is announcing that it will soon allow users to block those annoying cookie consent banners. And frankly, if you use a uh, ad blocker, as many do, you often can set those to block those banners too. That's why this law was stupid. Because A, it served no purpose. It annoys people, wastes a lot of bandwidth, wastes a lot of time, is potentially privacy invasion, and then ultimately teaches people (laughs) how to use ad blockers and other technologies to turn them off. Exactly the opposite of the intent of the EU. Congratulations. You're big winners in the stupid law category. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week. And I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another excursion into amateur radio history? This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY. And I'll be back in a moment with another installment of the ancient amateur archives. Amateurs entered the summer of 1912 with a new radio act in place. Thanks to the Titanic disaster and the fear that commercial interests would try to monopolize the radio spectrum, the government stepped in and set up a licensing structure administered by the Secretary of Commerce. In the new law, amateurs, actually private stations, were limited to a wavelength of 200 meters and a maximum power of one kilowatt. Since the no usable spectrum at that time ran from about 300 to 3,000 meters, or 1,000 kilocycles to 100 kilocycles, it was widely believed that amateur radio would fade away without expensive government enforcement. At first, it appeared the bureaucrats were correct. Before the Radio Act, there were an estimated 10,000 stations. Now, there were only 1,200 licenses issued by the end of 1912. Amateurs were finding it difficult to get their spark stations going on 200 meters, and when they did, they discovered their maximum range was 25 to 50 miles instead of the 250 to 500 mile range they had on the longer wavelengths. Amateur radio was slowly heading for oblivion. The big stumbling block to effective communications on 200 meters, or indeed any wavelength, was the spark transmitter and unamplified detector, both of which were extremely inefficient. On the transmitting end, no method other than spark was known. As for the receiver, there had been two developments in the vacuum tube area. J.A. Fleming had developed the diode detector in 1904. It cost a lot of money, provided no amplification, and used expensive batteries. It was not practical at the time, but it was covered by a patent. In 1906, Lee DeForest took Fleming's valve, added a third element called a grid, and named the result the audion. In the right circuit, the audion could amplify by a factor of five. Still, because of the cost, battery requirement, and the ever-popular patent fights of the time, it went unnoticed and unused until 1912, when a 22-year-old amateur made an important discovery. Edwin H. Armstrong was an experimenter and almost militant individualist. He had obtained an audion for use in his station. Dissatisfied with the poor amplification, he tried different circuits. 
At one point, he fed back a portion of the output back into the input to be reamplified. Instead of just a five times amplification, the output was now 100 times stronger than the input. He also discovered that if too much feedback was used, the tube began to oscillate. This regenerative circuit was the most important discovery in radio in years. One tube could amplify more than 100 times. Two tubes in series could give a gain of 2,000 plus. In addition, an alternative to spark was now available. Instead of a raspy, broad, inefficient signal that took up hundreds of kilocycles, the audion could be made to oscillate a stable, pure signal on one frequency. In fact, that's where the phrase CW comes from. A continuous wave on one frequency rather than a broad, intermittent wave on many. Although it would take more than 10 years to develop the stability in transmitters and receivers to fully utilize CW, King Spark was doomed. Realizing the importance of his regenerative design in both transmitting and receiving, but lacking the money to develop it, in January 1913, Armstrong had the diagrams of his circuit notarized. This was only the first of many spectacular inventions Armstrong would come up with. Within 10 years, he would also develop the Super Heterodyne, now used in all receivers, and the Super Regenerative, the basis of all VHF and UHF receivers from the 20s through the 50s, and still used today in children's walkie-talkies. Even his first design, the Regenerative Circuit, is used by Tentec and MFJ in their receiver kits. The crowning achievement in Armstrong's career came in the 1930s when he developed frequency modulation. With all due respect for those who flocked to Loomis, Tesla, or Marconi as the father of radio, my vote goes to Armstrong, for without him, wireless would be stuck at the 1912 level. Armstrong had a tempestuous life, full of public and private battles, advancements, setbacks, and lawsuits before his tragic death in 1954. The final legal battles did not end until 1967. Meanwhile, back in 1913, word of the regenerative circuit spread quickly throughout the amateur world. Experimenters who added the audion to their receivers discovered that distances of up to 350 miles were now possible on two meters. The audion, already scarce and expensive, became even more so under the laws of supply and demand. The search for an audion to the amateur was like the quest for the Holy Grail. In fact, it was this search which led to the second pivotal event in amateur radio history. Hiram Percy Maxim was a 44-year-old engineer and inventor who had a one-kilowatt amateur station in Hartford, Connecticut. He wanted an audion for his receiver and was unable to locate one. Finally, he heard of an amateur in Springfield, Massachusetts who had one for sale. Hartford was, and still is, only 30 miles from Springfield, yet Maxim stations could not cover the distance. He found a station midway between the two cities that was willing to relay his purchase offer. Maxson thought about this and eventually realized that a national organization was needed to coordinate and standardize message relay procedures as well as act as a national lobby for amateur radio interests. On April 6, 1914, Maxson proposed the formation of the American Radio Relay League. With the backing of the Radio Club of Hartford, who appropriated $50 and some volunteers, Maxim developed an application form explaining the purpose of the ARRL and inviting membership. These were sent out to every known major station in the country. Maxim, like Armstrong, was a prolific inventor. Unlike Armstrong, however, Maxim was also an expert in publicity and public relations. By July, national magazines such as Popular Mechanics were writing favorable reports about the ARRL. Maxim also traveled to Washington, D.C. to explain the ARRL to the Department of Commerce and the Commissioner of Navigation. The PR Blitz paid off. By September 1914, there were 237 relay stations appointed and traffic routes were established from Maine to Minneapolis and Seattle to Idaho. Realizing that long distances on 200 meters were not possible at that time, even with a regenerative receiver, Maxim got the Department of Commerce to authorize special operations on 425 meters, or 706 kilocycles, for relay stations in remote areas. Boosted by the publicity, the number of amateur stations, as well as the relay stations in the ARRL continued to grow. 
By 1916, there were 6,000 amateur licenses, of which 1,000 were ARRL relay stations, and there were 150,000 receivers in use. The emphasis in the ARRL was on the word relay. ARRL stations were expected to handle traffic on the six main trunk lines, three north-south and three east-west, that served more than 150 cities, and there was traffic. The general population, to whom phones were a luxury, long distance an exotic concept, and telegrams expensive, flocked to the idea of coast-to-coast -coast free messages. As a PR exercise to test the system nationwide, on Washington's birthday, 1916, a test message was sent to the governors of every state and President Wilson in Washington, D.C. The message was delivered to 34 states and the president within 60 minutes. By 1917, the system was so refined that a message sent from New York to California took only 45 minutes. To deal with the increasing number of relay stations, the ARRL started a little magazine, which they called QST. Other amateur activities in this period brought favorable publicity to the hobby. In March 1913, a severe windstorm had knocked out power, telegraph, and telephone lines in the Midwest. Battery-powered amateur stations handled routine and emergency traffic until regular service was restored. This was the first documented emergency communications in amateur radio history. In 1915, amateur station 2MN determined that the powerful Telefunken station at Sayville, Long Island was sending information concerning Allied and neutral shipping to submarines at sea. Thanks to the work of this amateur, the government took over the station. However, the war in Europe was getting closer. In April 1917, based on continued violations of our neutrality and unrestricted submarine activity, Congress declared war against Germany. With the U.S. now in World War I, a message went out from the Secretary of Commerce to all private stations. By order of the Chief Radio Inspector, all transmitting and receiving stations were to be closed and disassembled, and all antennas taken down. Complete radio silence was to remain until the war ended and the order was revoked. Amateurs by the thousands packed away their stations and marched off to war. The 200-meter ban was silent. In September 1917, with no radioactivity permitted and 80% of the amateurs at war, QST ceased publication. Would amateur radio survive the war? Stay with us next time as we wait for Johnny to come marching home again. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's the week's, uh, this week's AMSAT news from Bruce Page, KK5DO. We've given some tips and how-to for working the FM satellites and the linear satellites, but did you know that besides using APRS on some of the satellites, there is a group that's doing WSJT-X. Well, they're using the linear satellite, 5 kilohertz from the bottom of the downlink and passband. It's also a group on Facebook that uses FT4 on satellites. This should make for a lot of fun for many of those that are digitally inclined. When working HF, you have many different uh, modes, uh, voice, of course, CW, slow scan TV, and ready, as well as the digital ones. Now you have almost the same ability on the satellites. If you have only work satellites during that time using voice, give the digital modes a try. There's something there for everyone on HF as well as on satellite. It's time for the weekly propagation forecast report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that average daily sunspot numbers and solar flux increased during the week. Sunspot numbers went from 111.4 to 114.9, and flux values went from 149.2 to 155.3. A good feel-good exercise is to compare these numbers with those from a year ago, when the sunspot reading was only 30.7 and flux was 86.9. Cycle 25 progression is better than predicted. October 9th saw a planetary A-index reading of 25. On that day, spaceweather.com warned that sunspot AR3112 had a delta-class magnetic field with energy for strong solar flares. The next day, they posted movies of two solar flares. The predicted solar flux from the United States Air Force and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration shows flux values peaking during the first week of November at 160. 
So let's take a look at what we have. The solar flux values of 130, 120, 115, and 117 will be applicable to October 14th through the 17th. It will be 120 on October 18th through the 20th, 130, 138 on October 21st and 22nd, 140 on October 23rd through the 25th, then 145, 145, and 150 on October 26th through the 28th, and then 155, 155, and 152 on October 29th through the 31st, and 160 on November 1st through the 8th. Let's take a quick look at the predicted planetary A index now. It will be 5 on October 14th, 8 on October 15th through the 16th, 5 on October 17th through the 19th, 12 on October 20th and 21st, 5 on October 22nd through the 26th, and then 12, 15, 12, and 20 on October 27th through the 30th. It'll be 15 on October 31st through November 1st, and then 18, 15, and 12 on November 2nd through the 4th. In Radio Sport Contesting this week, there are a lot of contests. The first five are for October 15th and 16th. That includes the ARRL EME Contest, CW Phone and Digital, the Jarts WW Ready Contest, Digital, the 1010 International Fall Contest, that's CW, the New York QSO Party, CW Phone and Digital, and the Worked All Germany Contest, CW and Phone. Then for October 15th, a couple there were at the Feldhell Sprint, that's digital, and also the Argentina National 7 MHz contest, that is phone. On the 16th, it looks like about five uh, contests there, the Asia Pacific uh, Fall Sprint, that's CW, the UBA on uh, contest, two meters, CW and phone, the Illinois QSO party, CW phone and digital, and on the 16th also the RSGB Rolo, that is uh, CW. Then on the 16th through the 17th, the Run for the Bacon QRP contest, that's CW. On October 17th to the 21st, the WARC ARRL School Club Roundup, CW Phone and Digital. And on October 17th, the RSGB FT4 contest, of course, that is FT4. And here are some upcoming section and state division conventions. On October 14th through the 16th, it's Pacificon hosting the ARRL Pacific Division Convention. That's in San Ramon, California. On October 15th, the Wisconsin Aries Races Conference of 2022. That's uh, hosting the ARRO Wisconsin State Convention at the Wisconsin Rapids, Wisconsin. October 29th, Copa Fest hosting the ARRL Arizona State Convention. That's in Maricopa, Arizona. And on November 5th through the 6th, the Stone Mountain Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Georgia Section Convention. That's in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Foundations of Amateur Radio. In my time as a member of the radio community, I've been in around 30 different shacks and a similar amount of campout style activations. I've operated at least 100 different radio setups with different operating styles, logging systems and power sources. I wouldn't say that I was particularly experienced, but I've seen enough to make some observations. My first observation is that radio shacks and setups tend to be messy. It's not unusual to see several radios, antenna tuners, amplifiers, switches, computers, power supplies, soldering iron and accumulated cruft in the form of resistors, wires, spare antennas, connectors, screws, knobs and globs of solder, all vying for space on the same bench at the same time. I'm looking at my own desk right now and I can count a hundred different objects within 60 seconds with no effort whatsoever. And that's on a desk that's barely larger than a square meter in size. I'm not particularly messy in the scheme of things. There's no food on this desk other than the cup of coffee I've just made. And there's no globs of solder or other sticky things like oil and glue, but still. One of my friends remarked the other day that no matter how much space we have, we always seem to run out. He wondered why. At the time, my reply was something along the lines of, well, it's for the same reason as your bank account never has enough money in it. While that observation is probably valid, I'd like to point out some side effects of a messy desk. If your intent is to operate the radio and get on air to make noise, there needs to be a working station. You need to be able to test it without having to move stuff around and fault finding needs to be part of the way the thing is set up. One station I visited had solved this problem by moving their operating station away from the wall so they had two access points, the front where you operate the station and the back where you test it. That way you get to have your cake and eat it too. The setup worked really well. 
Picture a few racks with gear, an operating desk arranged in an L shape but moved away from the wall, rather than pushed into the corner. Space limitations prevented you from walking all the way around it, but you could get to all but one side of one rack. All this was arranged into the space of a standard spare bedroom, pretty much the same as most shacks I've visited. I find myself looking around my own environment with this front and rear idea in mind and I'm having a think about how I might apply it. Another observation is that we never ever throw anything away, ever. I've seen antenna projects that were doomed to fail from day one. Spare screws, bits of wood, drawers and drawers of random electronic components, bits of wire, cut-off connectors, damaged bits of coax, half-wound balance, empty tubes of silicon, failed micro switches, bent waveguides, broken windings, arced air gap capacitors, empty boxes, plastic bags, old radio magazines, all waiting for the day that they become useful. Likely never. I'm not saying that this craft is never useful. I'm saying that the chances of them being useful is inversely proportional to the amount. That means the more junk you have, the less useful it is. Perhaps culling is a way to increase the usefulness of what's left. The ultimate example of something like this is a go-kart wheel bearing that I have lying on my desk. It's a piece of precision engineering, but it's stuffed. It has completed its useful service life, was discarded in the dirt, and I picked it up, cleaned it, oiled it, and now it sits on my desk. It looks great, feels nice to play with, but as objects go, it's one of the least useful items on my desk, otherwise filled with paper, computer gear, and radio gear. I just made the bold step to toss it in the bin. Not yet sure how I feel about it, but I'll try by saying that it's the beginning of making the remaining craft on my desk more useful. Perhaps our communal messiness is a thing to do with amateur radio as a hobby. Or perhaps we have more than our share of messy members of society. The very nature of our hobby is that we test and trial things while doing on-air stuff, like making contacts and chatting with friends. Perhaps we should arrange our workspaces to match. If you found a way to make it work for you, please feel free to let me know, and perhaps send me a picture or two. I'm Ono. Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. No matter how much studying you do, are you ever fully prepared to program your HT? I know sometimes I'm not. Do you know what it takes to successfully transport and set up a portable station? How do you get involved in emergency communications, select the right key for CW, or even build your own station and set it up for the different modes? Enter Ham Radio Boot Camp. Ham Radio Boot Camp was created by the Nashua Area Radio Society, N1FD, to address these questions and scores of others that new hams, seasoned hams, and even prospective hams may have. You don't even need to be in New Hampshire, or for that matter, New England, to attend the all-day session on November 5th. It is taking place on Zoom, and anyone in North America is able to attend. Sessions will start at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, focusing on subjects of concern for technician-level licensees. In the afternoon, topics move to issues encountered by hams who hold general or extra-class licenses. The program ends at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The program is free, but registration is mandatory. For more information, point your web browser at www.n1fd.org slash register dash ham dash bootcamp. Traditionally, beacons of safe navigation for ships at sea, lighthouses in England are about to become symbols of successful navigation for signals sent in their direction by amateur radio operators around the world. The organization that oversees the English Lighthouse Awards Scheme has set aside seven days, Saturday through the 22nd of October, through to Friday the 28th for the Lighthouse Challenge. Activators will be lighting up these towers, hoping for contacts from lighthouse hunters throughout England and beyond. According to the event website, contacts made during the week will also count towards the program's regular award. They may also contribute to other organizational awards since many carry a worked all Britain square and references for worldwide flora fauna or parks on the air. If you're interested in being a part of the activity during that week, just tune your rig up and get started. Registration is not necessary and the entry is free as there are the awards and certificates. Only activators are required to keep logs. For additional details, visit the English Lighthouse Awards 
That's one word, dot UK. Again, English Lighthouse Awards, dot UK. Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe, New York, was awarded the Save America's Treasures grant of $500,000 from the National Parks Service and National Endowment of the Arts that will be used to preserve the laboratory of inventor Nikola Tesla and restore it into a museum and global science center. The $500,000 in funds is critical to ensure the exterior stabilization and restoration of the circa 1901 laboratory building at Wardenclyffe. The structure is an international landmark with historic significance as the only surviving laboratory of science visionary Nikola Tesla. It is recognized as one of the key sites in global technology history for its part in the science, aerospace, telecommunications, and research hub that emerged in the Long Island, New York corridor, beginning with the cradle of aviation and growing to include Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, Brookhaven National Laboratory, Grumman Industries, and others. According to U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer, the Wardenclyffe Laboratory in Shoreham is one of Long Island's historical treasures, and I was proud to support funding for the Nikola Tesla Science Center through the Save America's Treasures program. Now half a million dollars are on the way to stabilize and restore Wardenclyffe, the only remaining laboratory of Nikola Tesla, one of history's most renowned engineers and visionary inventors. Mr. Tesla immigrated to America's shores and made world-altering discoveries right here in New York. Tesla Science Center is working each day to educate the public and preserve Tesla's legacy, and these much-needed federal funds will help fulfill that mission. Nikola Tesla is one of history's most influential inventors whose contributions include the alternating current induction motor, radio and remote control technology, advancements in neon and fluorescent lighting, the Tesla turbine, and other innovations. In 1901, Tesla began building Wardenclyffe as a radio city to transmit information and electrical power wirelessly around the world. The project was funded by J.P. Morgan, and Tesla commissioned the firm of his close friend, renowned architect Stanford White, to build the brick laboratory and a 187-foot transmitting tower. The project closed before completion in 1903 when Morgan withdrew funding and the tower was dismantled in 1917. The site was used commercially for over 50 years, then vacated and listed for sale in 2012. Wardenclyffe was acquired by Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe in 2013 after a record-breaking crowdfund raised the purchase funds from 33,000 donors based in 108 countries. Wardenclyffe was placed on the U.S. National Historic Register in 2018 after receiving another record number of endorsements from around the world. On-site events are in high demand, and TSCW offers several annual events that are established visitor attractions, such as the Tesla Birthday Expo. In 2022, this event brought over 2,000 visitors to Wardenclyffe to witness the world's largest Tesla coil, a four-story model that was demonstrated on the original tower base that once held Tesla's transmitting tower. An outdoor expo provided attendees of all ages with an interactive, steam-focused experience that featured robotics, ham radio, Tesla Car Showcase, Tesla-inspired wine experience, neon sculptures, and youth activity station. Hands-on exhibits offered both education and entertainment to visitors who explored electromagnetic models and history displays that featured virtual reality effects, theremin music, Tesla's inventions, and more. Mark Alessi, TSCW Executive Director, 
states Warden Cliff is a place where perseverance, preservation, and innovation come together for the benefit of our community. Nikola Tesla was not just an inventor of the past. He was an innovator for our present and future, a visionary whose work continues to inspire engineers, scientists, and lifelong learners to be their own version of Tesla. The Save America Treasures Grant is helping us build a space where people of all ages can innovate and learn. Formed a little more than a year ago, the Sudan Amateur Radio Union has become the newest member society of the International Amateur Radio Union. The group, which represents the interests of hams in Northeast African nation, has a membership of 54. It was formed on August 6th of 2021 and is part of Region 1 of the IARU. Meanwhile, an influential and well-respected member of the Western New York amateur radio community has become a silent key. John Mueller, K2BT, died on October 9th following a lengthy illness. Licensed since November 2004, John held an amateur extra license. A volunteer examiner and member of Skywarn, John served as AWRL Western New York Section Manager from 2012 through 2014 and was Emergency Coordinator for Chautauqua County Aries from 2010 through 2012. John was a past president of the Chautauqua County Amateur FM Association and a veteran of the U.S. Army. John's widow, Laura Mueller, N2LJM, serves as current Section Manager for Western New York. John was 63. According to the European Space Agency, the team developing IRSAT-1, Ireland's first satellite, has returned from Belgium, where the project underwent rigorous testing at the CubeSat support facility, including an assessment to ensure that it would survive a launch. The University College Dublin team includes David Murphy, EI-9HWB, and Lana Salmon, EI-9HXB. They are developing the Low Earth Orbit, or LEO, CubeSat as part of the European Space Agency's Fly Your Satellite program. ESA administrators have said that in the past they view the project as a way to grow a new generation of space scientists and engineers and to nurture a space program for Ireland. The satellite is tentatively scheduled for a launch from a European Space Agency base in French Guiana by early 2023. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. This month, we'll cover the second of a two-part series on tower owner and tower climber vocabulary. As I said last month, many of the phrases and names came originally from those used in sailing vessels. So here we go with part two. Philly strand is a non-conductive cable used for guying towers instead of stranded steel cables. This is to help minimize the effect of cables on FM antennas, radiation patterns, standing wave, and so on. These cables are resin matrix based polymers. By the way, polymer essentially means a repeating chain molecule where the long strands of molecules are bonded side by side and end to end. Rubber is a polymer, so is nylon. A headache ball is a counterweight that is the same as or more than the weight of the rope used to lift things up the tower. This way, the rope can return to the ground with little effort and to minimize the rope getting stuck into the tower. The load line is the rope or cable used to pull cargo up the side of the tower by hand or by winch. The tag line is the cord used to help pull the load being lifted away from the tower. The tag line is attached to the load. Another method of lifting loads up a tower is with a trolley line. This is attached and fixed on both ends, like a cable car support. The load is then hoisted along the trolley line. A kip is a unit of measure used by structural engineers. A kip is equal to 1,000 pounds. Guy wire tension and loading tables are usually given in kips. A torque arm mounts to the side of the tower and is the attachment point for guy cables. A torque arm is wider than the point on the tower it mounts on. By increasing the width of the tower and allowing for additional guy cables, this helps to stabilize the tower, especially to wind-related twisting. Torque arms are commonly found on microwave towers. The mast is a steel pipe the top mount antenna is attached to. 
The origin of this term is obviously connected to sailing. Many people from England refer to the entire tower as a mast. A spud is a heavy, open-ended wrench with a long pointy handle. These wrenches have been commonly found marked with the thread size of the bolt they fit and not the head size. For tower assembly, this is a good one to keep tied to you or bring spares. A nose bag is similar to a feed bag hung over the head of a horse. These strong canvas bags are used to hold tower working tools and hardware. And now for this month's tower work hints. Shoes. Never climb with athletic type shoes. After spending 30 minutes or longer with your shoes in the bite between a vertical and diagonal steel strap, you'll wish you had worn hard soled shoes. Boots aren't necessary, but a deep tread steel toed shoe is best. Pick one with a deep cut or void in the tread below the arch in your feet. This can help steady your feet on the tower. As you climb, use this to help to prevent slipping. One of my biggest gripes about tower work is worse during a long dry spell. Bird droppings carry diseases and other nasty stuff you don't need to get into your mouth. So during the summer, when your tower gets that crunchy white coating, don't forget to wash your hands before you eat anything. This can be a problem if you like to chew candy or gum while spending time on the tower. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. There is nothing that amateurs across the world like more than collecting wallpaper for their ham shacks. Hams love exchanging QSL cards, be it traditionally through the snail mail system or electronically on the Internet. These QSL cards often reflect the personality of the amateur that they represent, and some can be quite artistic. With a look at the art and design of Amateur Radio QSL cards, we go to this special report, put together by Steve Richards, G4HPE, through the facilities of the Southgate Vibes News Service. The Daily Heller column by Stephen Heller, Kilo Charlie 1, Charlie Kilo Romeo, in print magazine, features amateur radio QSL card design. Stephen comments that for the real transmitting fanatics, CB radio was never the ultimate thrill. Ham or amateur radio was the ultimate means to reach out and touch somebody, not just a mile or two away, but given the proper weather conditions, hundreds, even thousands of miles from one's personal radio shack, which in Steve's case was a corner of his bedroom. Whether CB or ham, one of the prizes was making contact and sharing location information. In return, the operators mailed out and collected QSL cards. Strictly, QSL means either the question, do you confirm receipt of my transmission, or the statement, I confirm receipt of your transmission. It can also mean, please send me a QSL card. These are usually about the same size as a postcard, often elaborately decorated to express individuality. QSL cards routinely show a call sign or listener number, a place of origin, the time, date and frequency of the contact, and reception quality reports. Some cards have illustrative elements, others are just basic wording. They're still used, but often sent digitally these days. Although the sending of QSL cards via postal bureau is still practiced, the internet has pretty much taken over. The organisation Standards Manual is an independent publishing imprint founded by designers Jesse Reed and Hamish Smythe in New York City in 2014. Their mission is to archive and preserve artefacts of design history and make them available to future generations. From reprinted graphics standards manuals to new compendiums of archival work, their titles always aim to make great design available to all. When they researched it, the graphics associated with QSL cards were a revelation to Standards Manual, and they just released their latest book, QSL, Do You Confirm Receipt of My Transmission? It's a collection of over 150 QSL card designs, showcasing the often overlooked visual history of amateur radio. When they saw an archive from the collection of QSL card designer Roger Bova, who also specialises in identity and branding design, the Standards Manual team were amazed by the graphics. Jesse Reed said that the cards reveal a rich typographic expression that is rare in their authenticity, each card a personal reflection of the station's operator. 
You can read Stephen's full editorial column at www.printmag.com. Search for the Art and Design of Ham Radio item. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copy sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on nets and great repeater systems like our newest affiliates, the K2IWR repeater on 147.180 MHz in Cortland, New York, and the K2MST repeater on 443.150 MHz serving all of Syracuse, New York. We welcome them aboard the vast This Week in Amateur Radio network of repeaters and nets around the world. If your net or repeater carries This Week in Amateur Radio, why not let us know about it and we'll give you a free promo here on the air. All you need to do is put all the details into an email and give us the repeater call sign, frequency, area served, and the days and times that you carry This Week in Amateur Radio and send it off in an email to w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you. That address, once again, is w2xbs77 at gmail.com. We hope to hear from you real soon. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, the Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine.